Thank you, Brother Tony. That was very good. I want to give you an exhortation from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. It seems so fitting. Where we find these words saying, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end, for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so that's my word to you this morning, particularly to hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Hope is a very potent thing, a very necessary thing in the life of faith. In fact, Romans chapter 8 says that we are saved by hope. See? It moves us to great patience. It's not the kind of thing that separates you from sin, but it's the kind of thing that keeps you separate from sin. You see what I'm saying there? It provokes great patience in you because we don't yet have the thing for which we hope for, and yet do we wait for it. That's the kind of potency that hope has for us. There are marvelous examples of hope, and of course, I'm giving you two examples, and both of these men fought a good fight and finished their race. I'm really not interested in the advice of someone who's failing in the life of faith. We're not interested in theory, are we? And we are interested in being faithful to the end. It's the overcomers that get the inheritance. That's so critical. That's why this, is thing, this thing is according to the hope of eternal life. It's necessary that we hope to the end in order to obtain the inheritance. The first example is Noah. The scripture says, and since we so often mention Noah lately, I thought this was a marvelous example. The scripture says of Noah in Hebrews chapter 11 that by faith, Noah, being moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his own house. Now I know that some men can't get hope and fear in the same place. But Noah had hope and fear. See? It was the fear that the flood was coming on the earth that moved Noah. It was the knowledge that wrath was coming and it could not be averted that moved Noah. But it was also the report from God that God's gracious intent was to save Noah through the preparing of an ark that Noah in hope prepared an ark to the saving of his own house. Now, we do live each day with the knowledge of impending judgment. It's coming. A lot of brethren have been talking about this a lot lately. Brother Mike has talked about it quite a bit. Brother Gibbon has talked about it quite a bit. The wrath is coming. This is part of being sober. Jesus is going to sit on his judgment seat and separate between the righteous and the unrighteous. Hmm? That is going to happen. See, the wrath of God is going to be revealed and has already been revealed. It shall be revealed in its fullness. It's necessary that we be saved from it. And so I think of that marvelous word in the scripture. He says, you've not been appointed to wrath. God wouldn't bring you out of sin and then destroy you in the end. That's not his intention in saving you. See, you've not been appointed to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So the knowledge of these things and the sobriety of these things moves us in fear to, so to speak, prepare an ark to the saving of our own house. And so let's, let's, brethren, let's encourage ourselves both to think about the wrath of God to come and think about the things God has said about saving us from the wrath to come. Because the truth of the matter is, if in Jesus' death he saved you by his death, much more, brethren, shall he save you by the marvelous life which he is living. And his intent is, in fact, to save you from the wrath to come, because it is coming. Think of the Apostle Paul. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul articulates this great text of hope that he had toward God. He gave you kind of this constraining element that moved him to do the things which he did. And you know Paul was a prodigious worker in the face of great conflict. And he tells you this is the thing that was moving me through all that. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. How about that for hope? Hope brings you down to moving for one thing. Because everything you do is done on the basis of one thing you're looking for. One thing you want. This one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forth of those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, every man lives for what he perceives to be the most valuable thing. The reason why Paul forgot the things which are behind 
is because the things that he saw ahead of him were superior to what was behind him. The only reason my men look back is because they believe the things which they've been delivered from have more value than what God has delivered them to. That's why. That's why. Don't we get that? When Jesus talked about the kingdom of heaven is like the man that found a treasure hid in the field to which when he found sold all that he had and for joy thereof. Isn't that a picture of what hope is? See, hope is built firmly on the foundation of this fact. We know that what God has delivered us to has greater value to us than what he's delivered us from. Anything God has asked you to leave, brethren, is nothing but rags. But what he's called you to obtain is true riches. Now, Paul is an example of this, and every godly person from Abel on has in some sense seen something in God that has caused the world to lose its glory to them. Because if you think you're going to be able to overcome the enticements of the world just by a sheer will of your own self without seeing something superior, it's not going to happen. The gospel calls us to a superior thing. Hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought to you. So let's be encouraged by that, brethren. Think of Think of some of those things that are coming. I like to contrast what the world offers you with what God gives you. Because it's, it's, it's like a sanctified way of keeping yourself from the world. Think of this. Everything God has called you to will be something that you'll never have to leave. Never. The relationships that you are making with godly people now, you'll never, ever, ever have to have, leave those relationships. They may be parted by death for a time, but reunited when we're gathered together again. Everything in the world, some point you got to leave it. Either you're going to die or it's going to rust and corrupt. But nothing in the kingdom is that way. See, that's a source of great consolation. Think of this, that we are looking for a world wherein dwells righteousness. See here, you might see, find, find certain pockets of righteousness here. You find some godly people, good meanings and things like this. And yet when you walk out the door, you're confronted with some kind of ungodliness that you have to wrestle with and face and fight off. And you find places in this world where you don't feel comfortable because you're saved and you're righteous. See, you're oppressed by ungodliness. If it's not outside there, it's in here. But a world wherein dwells righteousness, there will never be a place in the quadrant of the world to come that you will go that you will ever feel uncomfortable or feel the need to put on your armor. It won't be like that. It's a world wherein dwells righteousness. And you can be encouraged by that. You know, one of the things that I've been so greatly encouraged by lately of the hope that is to come is to be united with these spirits of just men made perfect. I have, as I've grown sensitive to the Lord, I have so much enjoyed my fellowship with godly people that have gone on through the things that they've written. Michael Card uh, sings a song, so many books, so little time. We have such a marvelous godly heritage of not just books, but the people. Those books were forged in suffering and by faith. These are men of like passion, just like you, but they wrote their thoughts down and you find yourself consoled and encouraged by them. See, the ungodly heritage is an ungodly heritage. It's a dishonorable heritage, but you are part of a heritage that's godly and honorable. And we have people in that heritage that one day we're going to meet them face to face. You're going to sit down in the kingdom with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I'll tell you what, we'll be eating our meat with singleness and godliness of heart in a way that you've never done before. It's going to be a marvelous time. And you'll be able to talk about your deliverances one with another. And the knowledge of Christ, I can see, will peak during that time. So, brethren, these and many more reasons compel us. God is good. And he's got a good end for his people. And as much as in you is to see as far as you can <laughs> to what is yet coming will compel and encourage you each day to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and to live soberly, righteously, and godly and looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of Christ Jesus. So let's, that's where other, when we come together, we stir one another to the hope of these things. And if we taste of them, 
our appetite for these things increases. So let's be encouraged about this. Our God is a good God. Isn't hope built upon this foundation of an understanding that God is good? He justified you in the past and showed his goodness. He's already demonstrated it towards you. There's more goodness yet to come. So let's hope to the end for the grace that's going to be brought to us at that time. I open up for your comments.